All right, what's going on, everybody? It's Ryan from Recluse Audio. You know how it is. We're going to look at Pulsar today. Uh, I've discussed before about how useful Pulsar is in live applications, but I wanted to show you today that it is very useful with automation and scripted structured things ahead of time. So I've gone ahead and constructed a little quartet for what I'm going to call a young person's guide to Pulsar synthesis, a little homage to my friend Benjamin Britten. I'm sure he would love this. So you see right here on first chair, we have Curtis Rhodes and we have Barry Truo, uh, famous for River Run and Pacific. You should go look all these people up. I can't give a full explanation. You're Stockhausen using uh, analog pulsar synthesis in Contacta to transverse the continuum of pitch to rhythm. And Xenakis, king of st stochasticism, professor at Indiana University for many years, very famous electronic composer. <clears throat> You'll hear me talk about Rhodes a lot. Apparently, uh, well, we won't go into that. Okay, so let's listen here. What we're going to do is use the same clips and kind of layer them on as we go. So it's going to um, be varied fundamentals first. Then we're going to vary the wave shape. We're going to change the trigger pattern and so on. We're going to add new layers and textures as we go. Everything's going to be sent to Reflections, my uh, plugin, Reverb Delay Send Back Feedback Loop. It's right here. Uh, so even when it's dry, quote unquote, because later I'll add a phaser and add a Valhalla frequency echo, uh, it's going to be going to a little bit of reverb. Okay, so let's hear it. Let's hear the first one. This is just with uh, varied fundamental frequencies. So really what it ends up sounding like is kind of a polyrhythmic texture. Let's listen. So, I mean, that can be used in a very nice way uh, for polyrhythmic textures. And what can be fun is uh, I when I compose this way, because Pulsar is really on its own tempo track, right? They can all synchronize here just based on their fundamental frequencies, not based on project tempo. Uh, so I have these lines of automation drawn in as we go on, like... Um, There we go. Right here. And if I want to speed everything up, rather I can just uh, increase the tempo and it will read through faster. So it keeps them proportionally the same. It's kind of like working with ticks. Uh, and I make everything 32 bars so I can tell exactly where halfway point is. It's kind of cool for electroacoustic and sound design composition. Obviously it's not gonna work for tempo synchronization. All right, let's go ahead to wave shape now. So we're just going to modify the wave shapes, shapes a little bit. Each pulsar now, it's still going to have its own fundamental frequency, its own rhythm in the polyrhythm that we're creating. But now it's going to have its own spectrum as well. Let's see how that changes things. Oops. So you can see uh, they begin to have their own identity a little bit more. Uh, some of them are a little bit punchier. I think visually it is obvious as they transform um, when that transformation is occurring. So that can be useful if you are performing to keep track of where you are in the sound spectrum. Okay, now we're going to go to a trigger pattern. And as well as changing the trigger pattern, we're going to change the... Uh, fundamental as well so we're going to have uh varied patterns we'll see here in just a second um some will be on some will be off let's listen to that
All right, so over here, we have patterns of three to two, six to four. So this actually makes me think I should change Mr. Truow's pattern because six to four is pretty much the same as three to two, even though obviously there is a temporal difference. Let's go ahead and switch that up. Let's go seven to four. And you can see I copied the automation for each one. Okay, let's listen to the trigger pattern again. Okay, so it sounds pretty good. Sounds a little punchy. I think I would want to personally play with some other parameters a little bit to make it... Um, uh, there's a lot of activity going on right now, but we have several more steps to go. So let's keep going. Uh, in this next one, I'm going to adjust the amplitude so I can have kind of a uh, dynamic shift, like different members will come to the forefront of the sound. Um, let me get the amplitude here so we can look at it. If you are unfamiliar with this in Ableton. This is a compositional style that's very nice. Ableton also, our uh, system for automation, which is a compositional style that I really like, but Ableton also will allow you to modulate these parameters within clips as well, which is different than uh, automation. It's not a fixed time thing. So, um, all right. So you can see that like they crescendo in and out of the forefront. Let's listen to it. So there we varied not just the amplitude for dynamic texture changes, but we also varied the width. So sometimes it will start to, as the width gets wider, um, have a larger presence of that formant frequency. So we get a uh, renewed emphasis on that formant frequency. It can have a drastic shift in the sound, especially then if we start sending it to the phaser like we will later, or we start using a spread and stochasticism with the formant. because. It's one thing if it's a tiny single cycle formant frequency of, of a formant frequency that's being passed through this transformation and processing. But if it's a longer um, pulserette with multiple periods of that formant frequency and then we're shifting it, it can be even more drastically changed. Test, test. Alrighty, it was getting a little long, so we made a part two. We're going to continue on with more exploration of pulsar and automation. Keep watching.